Hello everyone, my name is Fatima and you're listening to The Paper Cut, a podcast about books and reading from the Middle East, Africa and South Asia. On this episode, we're taking a break from our latest series to bring you a very special guest, Ammar and naimi Ammar is an Omani author, copywriter and journalist. His first collection of short stories called Unoriginal Tales are small, brief urban fantasies which take place in Oman. And guess what? You're going to be hearing one of those stories today, recited by Ammar himself, and followed by a quick Q&A. So sit back, relax, close your eyes, unless you're operating heavy machinery, and let's escape into Ammar's world where anything can happen. Rookie Mistake by Ammar Naimi. The sun poked its head out from the heavens and seemed to glare at them as Bedria tried to focus on the task awaiting her. Transfiguration. Bedria was 15 years old and already one of the most promising sages to come out of Al-Ma'bila and Masqat Aman. She could scry the moon and dreams to find hidden meanings, and she had even managed to levitate now and then under the tutelage of her master, Bakhsh. However, what she was learning today was more difficult than any of these tasks, and Bakhsh frowned at her as he watched. Repeat again, he said, and Bedria sighed. Transfiguration is the art of turning into an animal. It can help us gain wisdom from the natural world, and it marks the official tutelage of any sage, she recited. The magic is inherent, waiting somewhere in the nature of animals that we all share. I only have to bring the nature of the animal up to the surface. Bakhsh harumphed. And without aid the first time you do it. Now listen. He took his long cane and stomped it into the ground formally. The first transformation will be difficult. The animal will take over you for a time, and it will be my magic that awakens it. You must remain an animal for five hours. Think about what you want to be carefully, he added, stomping his cane with every word to accentuate the point. Bedria frowned. She knew all of this already. She'd studied it a thousand times while she was supposed to prepare for science or math tests for school. I'm ready, she said with a firm nod. She could feel Bakhsh lending her the power she'd need for the transformation. His eyes focused. Her skin felt hot and invisible needles pricked her all over. The feeling grew stronger and stronger until she felt something opening up inside of her. Threads lay in the deepest part of her soul. They connected the bits that made everything what it was, from man to woman to bird and dinosaur, as well as that one special animal, small and friendly. This? This was going to be perfect. Suddenly, one of the pieces inside of her unraveled disconnecting and reconnecting lines that it filled with magic. She shrunk slowly, feeling hair seep out from under her skin and her tongue loll out. Bakhsh stared at Bedria as she completed her transformation, and his face twisted in horror. Oh no, oh no, not that, he exclaimed. She barked in response, realizing vaguely that she had turned into a medium-sized wadi dog, the type of dogs most common in Oman long-eared and about waist-high, Bedria nonetheless felt a wiry strength coursing through her veins. Just as the man made a run to her, shouting something, Bedria's animal instincts kicked in with an explosion of sounds, smells, and feelings. She darted as if shot out the end of a cannon, making her way into the dry plains of Al-Ma'bila, with its long rows of traffic lights and spots of residential buildings. The land lowered into a small wadi, a valley to her left, And as she ran, she realized that she could hear and smell things that she hadn't even known existed. A row of mechanic shops were ahead, and Bedria avoided them because she could smell something in the oil glazing the employees' overalls. The smell reminded her of the insides of a fish, and so she moved away and towards a playground where she heard the mean streak in a girl's laugh. No, best not to go there. Bedria bounded across the plains, forgetting completely about the man with the stick behind her, 
who shouted things in a dog father warning little cubs sort of voice. Ahead, she could smell water not yet falling. It was in the air. Suddenly, a small two legs, a man, popped out onto the road ahead of her, smiling uncertainly. His smile felt like, let's keep the peace and I, I want you to have food. But Bedria still felt uncertain and shy, and so she whimpered and ran away from him reluctantly, making it to the middle of the plains before thinking about going back to the man. Bedria knew that she had forgotten something extremely important, but she barked excitedly at a green small knot snake and forgot what she had forgotten about. Man, she loved small green knot snakes. She heard cracks in the distance and did not consider anything out of the ordinary until Beria saw a big metal box on circles. Another two legs was leaning out of it, giving off an emotionless scent. This was odd, as most humans smelled of some feeling or the other. These feelings, these scents, they usually told her what to expect. But this two legs, he felt nothing at all. Already nervous, she looked to the side. The path to freedom was open and she knew the two legs could not run as fast as she could. When she looked back at him, she saw he now held a long metallic tube in his hand. Odd, why is he looking at it with such resignation? He seemed tired, as if the tube was something, something important. It's not a tube, a small voice said in her head. It's a gun. He's a policeman and you're a dog without a collar. Run! Just as the man aimed, Bedria exploded into action and ran in zigzags across the wastes, not letting the man point that hated tube, that gun, at her. A crack shattered the air and she heard something smash into the ground beside her. Pebbles shot up into her flank, making her yelp as they dug deep into her fur. Bedria ran without thinking, letting her body take over as she crossed street after street, blood coming down her skin and splashing onto the black path humans take even as the sun set slowly. The car rumbled in the distance, not following her, but patrolling, causing her heart to beat like a drum as she imagined being found and then shot. She needed to hide from the police. Bedria ducked into an alleyway, only to hear someone gasp. Looking to the side, she saw a small house. The two-legged man from earlier stood now at the door, watching her. He seemed to weigh something, and as their eyes met, his eyes gained a determined edge. He opened his front door wider for her, and Bedria scrambled in immediately into the bathroom, suddenly terrified and shaking. The man came in with a blanket in his hands, his lips full of soothing apologies as he covered her up and scratched her behind the ears. Bedria grimaced at first, but the scratches pulled at a pleasurable spot deep inside of her soul, and her tail started wagging. Ah, oh, those regulations are ridiculous, the man fumed. Too many dogs, ugh. I hate that they just get to shoot. They have no right, no right whatsoever, he mumbled as he continued to coddle Bedria. The hour she spent there felt wonderful. She was constantly giving doses of care that no dog had ever been given before. She knew that, she knew it for a fact. She was the most special dog in the world. The police were outside the house, and they would be forever, and she knew instinctively that she would do anything for this man as long as he continued scratching behind her ear. And suddenly, something happened. The threads of what she was began to unravel. The man pulled back fearfully when it began, and Bedria began to grow bigger and bigger. Her fur pulled back, as did her tongue and ears, and suddenly she was standing on two legs, a fully dressed teenager standing in the middle of someone's bathroom. The man looked at her in mortified silence. Embarrassed, Bedria said, I, um, thanks. I need to call my teacher, but I'll be out of your house in a bit. The man gave her a horrified nod, seeming numb with shock, and Bedria sighed and pulled out her iPhone, dialing in for Bakhsh. He was gonna shout at her, she just knew it. But what was she meant to say? She hadn't known being a dog in Muscat could be so dangerous. As soon as he answered, Bedria could hear her teacher screaming at the top of his lungs, You idiot! What were you thinking? 
Where are you? I'm sorry, she replied. I'm inside the house, sending location in a bit. Idiot! Um, Mr. Bush? She asked hesitantly. Did I pass the test? Am I officially a SAGE student now? Her teacher almost spat. Well, you're goddamn alive, aren't you? I swear to God I'm going to make you scrub every floor in my house clean until you spit up blood. Bach hung up on her, leaving Bedria to wonder if that was a yes or a no. Looking at the man who'd saved her life, Bedria began to blush. He'd scratched her behind the ears. I, um... Do you want your phone back? She asked him. The man was starting to come to grips with exactly how ludicrous the situation he'd found himself in was. He leaned back against the back of the restroom, his eyes wide, and he shook his head. Oh, what's going on? That's not a very easy question to answer, she told him quietly. Weaving patterns of magic around his trembling body, the magic grew in power as she whispered softly, urging it onwards until it grew into a green, almost luminous mist that wrapped around the man. He couldn't see it, of course, but it went around and round, rising like a tornado. And as it did, the man's eyes drooped slowly downwards and his body ceased its shaking. Instead of finding out about things that you don't need to know, Bedria added, taking a cautious step forward, isn't it better not to trouble yourself? She kept her voice in a lilting, soothing tone that further encouraged the man's eyelids downwards until they shut completely. Now, she added in a more cheerful air, how about you go to your room and sleep? The man licked his lips, his eyes still closed, and he said, sleep sounds good. It does, doesn't it? Bedria encouraged, guiding the man through his house by his elbow. I think you're sort of tired. I feel so tired. Probably the best thing for you to do is to go to sleep for 10, no, 12 hours. Just relax, have wonderful dreams where you play with dogs. Now he was up in his room, and the man lay over his large bed. On the side of the room sat a table with engineering equipment scattered over it, as well as a large Megmar, an Armani frankincense holder with some Liban smoke rising from it. Thank you for saving my life, Bedria told the man as he turned over in his bed and immediately began to dream. Bedria walked down the stairs thinking about the inherent goodness of some people and how there should be more of those people. How the man's small act of kindness of opening a door for her turned out to be larger than he'd ever believe. However, Bedria then opened the main door of the house and she stepped out, only to be confronted by Bakhsh. Her teacher's eyebrows were furrowed and thunderclouds played across his face. And suddenly, Bedria realized just how badly she'd messed up. The end. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, did you have any particular idea that inspired you to write this story? Yes. I mean, here's the thing. When it comes to Wadi dogs specifically, I love them a lot more than domesticated pet dogs. Mm -hmm. For some reason, there's something about that sort of wild feralness mm. that I keep thinking about. Mm. You know, every mm. month or so, I'll see a dog and I'll be like, ah, I hope he's happy <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Um, Obviously, I also wanted to see like the, the idea of magical mistakes, you know, mm. it's always like it's such a nice theme, a nice trope for you to explore different things. Mm. Uh, in this case, you know, uh, we see that, you know, why do dogs kind of sometimes have hard lives? Sometimes they don't find enough to eat. Sometimes it's really hot outside in mm. the summer. Mm. And sometimes, you know, the crowd control uh, can also be dangerous mm. for them. So I wanted to just puts the reader specifically in the shoes of a dog just living in Anmarbila mm. and what life might be like. So maybe like when we see a dog next time, you might be a little nicer. Yeah. And I love things that make us think, what if? Yeah, I love what if stories. Because, yeah. you know, like I, I really, uh, I, I think I made my nephew uh, listen to that story. I read it to him or he read it himself. Mm. And he, he comes back to me sometimes and, he'll, and he's like, uncle, I saw a dog. And I'm like, what if it's actually a girl, <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> that now there now his imagination is going to sort of like yeah. start to go wild a little bit. I, and cool. I love those kinds of stories. That's yeah. the entire idea of mm. unoriginal tales. Yeah. Obviously, I'm talking about specific themes that if you're living in Oman, you kind of know that what yeah. I'm talking about. Mm, 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 mm. But other than that, the thing about urban fantasy, mm. magic that exists in Masqat, mm -hmm. the idea of it at its root is what if behind you, you can just open a door and there's something magical happening mm. there? I, I got the sense that there was a lot of playfulness, you know, in that like you were having a lot of fun clearly while you were writing the story because you could feel that like, oh, what if, you know, she just turned into... And then what happens, you know, and yeah. all these like little adventures happen. She gets chased by down by a policeman and yeah, winds yeah. up in someone's house. And uh, I, th I think what happens is that I can say whatever I want about how I meant for this story to do that. Honest to God, I have no idea how any story is going to go until mm. I write it. And that's my purest form of writing. And that's what I, what I enjoy doing the most. Mm. So. If you feel like he's playing in this, I am. Yeah. Because I have no idea what's happening. Yeah, you know? yeah. I'm thinking, how is this dog going to survive? You yes. know, what's, what's in the mechanic shop? Yeah. Like, even yeah. right now, while I was reading it back, I'm wondering why uh, Bedria ran away from mm -hmm. the mechanic shop. She said something about the oil smelling like uh fish blackness yeah something of the inside of a fish yeah. yeah and so i think what i what actually happened is that she smelled the oil mm. and she's like that's really not good for dogs mm. to mm. for it to get on my fur mm -hmm. but i don't know yeah you know? <laughs> so when it comes to the other stories in the book do you have similar i don't know do you want to say themes or um ideas that you run with is there a, a recurring theme amongst the stories or are you trying out different things in each one I think when we go back to the stories and the way whenever a relative of mine or somebody in like who is an official or something asks me about it, I'm like, these are good stories for society. And that's because <laughs> like in each story, there is something that I thought was useful to explore. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's the life of dogs and how we can be kinder to them mm. or protect them. And another story, uh, which a lot of people connected to, thankfully, it was about uh, postnatal depression, mm. uh, which is okay. obviously something I don't know much about. Yeah. But uh, I'm glad that people connected to those stories. I think mm. every, each one of those stories, there's one about corruption and how mm. it's like a, a heist sort of story where mm. two kids try to like uh, stop somebody from being corrupt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I love exploring different themes. But in this case, in unoriginal, unoriginal tales specifically, I tried to do stories that people at the time were mm -hmm. talking about. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so whatever I saw people arguing about on Twitter or Instagram mm. or whatever, thank God for social media, <laughs> just seeing all of those fights. True. Uh, so sometimes I'll find something where I go, I want to explore this. Yeah. And I feel that by me exploring them, when I finish the story, I kind of understand it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's what the reader gets yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. You draw inspiration from everything that happens around you. And I guess that's what that's kind of what we feel like. That's what I feel when I read the book. It feels so like the story. It feels so current. I guess that's the, the cool part as well about having a story set in Oman, because as an Omani, I don't really see that, you know, ever. Yeah, yeah it's not <laughs> I mean, unique, like rarely, but um, it's not something that exists. And mm -hmm. to read something like that and it's it's not something about Oman, you know, and I am, you know, Captain Majid or whatever. Oh, but Captain <laughs> Majid is not real. <laughs> Ahmed bin Majid. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Oh, my God. <laughs> but Ahmed bin Majid, you know, like it's not something about something historical. It's today. Mm -hmm. It's happening now. Like, I love that. I've never seen that before. I, I, it's true because I don't read, uh, like I mentioned before, I don't read books in Arabic much. Mm -hmm. So to have like Armani stories represented on the page, yeah. it feels so exciting. And now it, it makes more sense to me when people talk about like representation and literature yes. and things like that. Yes, you know? I'm still relatively undecided on how much representation matters. Mm. But I think like during a conversation with somebody, we kind of summed it up really well, mm -hmm. which is it's not really about like the macro aspects of it, of it being something important and mm. political or whatever it is. It's simply the fact that you can read something mm -hmm. and you go like, oh, he's, uh, some sar. he's wearing amsar. Exactly, exactly. And it just makes you a little bit happier. Yes, and totally. You yeah. Know, if, if you want to watch Vikings with the, uh, 
you know, the European, it exists, you know, yeah. you can go check that out. Yeah, totally. No, I know what you mean. Like it, not every time that, you know, something that has to do with your own identity doesn't always have to be a grand statement, Yeah. you know, it, in fact, I think it's the, the opposite that's most important. It's just like what you True. said, it's the small little things like seeing your type of national dress, you know, in, mm -hmm, on the mm -hmm. page or like when I read uh, Celestial Bodies, when she mentioned some random place in Al-Khuayr or something, yeah. that made me really excited because I was like, I recognize that place. Oh, I recognize that Cornish and Sib. I recognize yeah. that this and that, you know? Uh, yeah, I think that's part of why uh, some people were also telling me about how they connected with uh, a story called... Uh, Stuff that I can't even remember. The Is one it? with Masqat Grandma. Yes, yes. And that's the, zombie. the silliest story. Yeah, it yeah. means nothing. It has no benefit to society <laughs> whatsoever. I, but I love that too. Like I love the, the fact about that story that uh, it was in Grand Mall. Yeah. And I hate parking in Grand Mall. Yeah, and I want to know? apologize to the people in charge of Masqat Grand Mall. I mean, I mean no disrespect to your mall. Uh, I mean every disrespect. No, I'm kidding. I mean, <laughs> why would you do that I'm with the kidding. basement? Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know what, 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 what have you been reading, by the way? Uh, so, interestingly, right now, I'm doing, I'm doing a buddy read with my friend mm -hmm. in Dubai um, of a really fantastic book called The Famished Road by mm -hmm. Ben Okri. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Okri is a Nigerian author. Okay. And this book is kind of almost like a contemporary classic of African literature. And okay. it's really... Uh, different from anything I've ever read. So basically there's this um, type of uh, folk tale or spiritual belief in Nigerian, like a, a tr local Nigerian religion uh -huh. or Nigerian culture. I think it's Yoruba culture in Nigeria where they believe in something called Abiku. And Abiku is basically a spirit child. It, they believe mm -hmm. that the, ch the un spirits of unborn children and the spirit world, they all live together in this other world, right? Whoa. Unborn children and also this, and the spirit children include, basically they, they go into the land of the living and they become people mm -hmm. and then they go back again to that spirit world. So sometimes one of those spirit children decides they want to stay in the living, the mm -hmm. land of the mm -hmm. living for whatever reason. Yeah. And so the story is about one of those. It's, it's um, an Abiku who goes and joins the land of the living and is born to a mother. Mm -hmm. And he decides that he wants to stay because of his mother. Okay. And so it's the, his, his journey. It's a very fantastical story. And if the Abiku You should 100% read it because this is right up your alley when it comes to like fantasy and mm -hmm. just the level of imagination. I feel like you would so appreciate it because it... First of all, it's it it's like 500 pages long, but it reads like it's like the smoothest read, reading experience oh. ever. Even though there's so many, like every page is so crowded with like all of these mythical creatures and characters, mm -hmm. but you just take it all in stride, and you can't really tell the difference between the magical creatures and the living creatures. You know and, what I mean? And you they, just end up gliding kind of, through the book. They kind of all mix up into one, which is really, I just don't know how he does it. Like, yeah. me and my friend were kind of like, re spent like the whole of our last um, catch up together just figuring out like, how did he do that? Like, I read 100 pages where every single page was um, really like crazily, like, he just, his imagination is just so amazing, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Each ca character is like, he makes makes one up off the top of his head, like there's a guy, a tall man with really long legs, but a very short body, and his eyes are tiny, and mm -hmm. he speaks like a child, like, what? This is so creepy, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's just one throwaway character, there's hundreds, hundreds. Anyways, I, I'll, I'm going, I don't know where the book is going yet, I'm not really sure about the plot, but. What happens if an Obiko decides, nah, I've had enough with the living world? They go back, Okay. yeah. Can I go a little bit depressing? Yeah. This reminds me of something that a comedian, uh, an American comedian was on Russell Howard's show on, yeah. uh, and he was talking, he, unfortunately his kid had passed away <clears throat> like the year before. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to describe that, mm. you know, the grieving process. Mm. And he said, now I've seen beyond the veil. Mm. I know that my children, when I hold them, mm that they are just pieces of stardust mm. that have formed into a person and one day they'll dissipate again and leave. You could just see like, you could hear people just sobbing while listening it to that. It gives me chills just to think about that. Yeah. But in a way, I kind of like, there's something so deep about this, like something at the core of the story that I resonate with so much 
because the I, the concept that he he introduces Ben Okri mm-hmm. in the story that when children are born they're more of another world than they are of this world sure. and i 100% believe that after having gone through the birth experience mm-hmm. and um there is something otherworldly about newborn children and they're just too pure they really are just too pure for this world yeah. and it's so hard to get that sentiment in writing because it's something that's been written about so much that it's hard to not make it sound cliched or yeah. trite you know what i mean like but but it's true and and the way that he describes it it's not like overly fluffy it's kind of there's that that feeling of otherworldliness about newborn children it's not all light and air it there's a bit of depth and darkness to it that yeah. it's so hard to pinpoint and i think that's what's really fascinating to me about this book yeah. you know um but yeah they are like of another world in a way and i feel like they have this knowledge i maybe i'm starting to sound a little bit kooky but i have this belief that children before they learn to speak they have knowledge that we don't know you oh, know and as they learn to speak they forget it yes i i really believe this that would that would make a cool story that would make a honest. very cool story i i actually super well, believe that you do it from you do it from the perspective of the baby mm. and he's trying to warn his parents about yes. the apocalypse or something yeah. like that <laughs> i'm i'm writing that yeah. story you should i i i really want to see this come into reality now <laughs> but what about you what are you reading are you reading anything uh, right now i think i'm reading like three or four different books at the same time because i make that mistake of starting something and mm. then but i'm <laughs> i'm listening to the night circus oh which aaron morgenstern yeah i yeah. i have thrown that book away for like <laughs> months because i i legitimately only heard the first page yeah and i hated it really and i was just like i don't care about this book it's too complicated yeah it's too like shaif nefso <laughs> is is eric it's eric okay like so self-conscious it's conscious kind of yeah yeah and i just left it and then i ran out of books to listen to mm. and i said ah, you know i'm driving i'll it's so good it is it's so, so good. and it just keeps getting better yeah. and better and like the the way that they describe things it's so ethereal mm it's it's re- all vibes i read this book like year when it first came out and mm-hmm. it's still very vivid like the imagery yeah the circus the black know, and the, the stars and the black green and, and the, the white and the children it, it's very vivid in my mind mm-hmm. uh, do you know something i don't know if you know this about that book but did you know that it was written for the you know national novel writing month Yes, yes. It no, happens every November. Yeah. Yeah. So, na- uh, the Night Circus was actually a NaNoWriMo project. But yeah, she wrote it as nas- a project and then she decided, "No, what? This has some potential." Mm-hmm. And she just saw, saw it through. And there were other books as well. Like one even got made into a movie, um, but I can't remember the name anymore. But yeah, that was a NaNoWriMo book as okay. well. Okay. So, anyways, yeah, that was just my I love that book, Night, night Circus. But it's um, it's really good. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of amazing books that come out every year, which is why I get pretty upset when yeah. somebody goes, uh, yeah, I only read this and that, this series, and there's, n- I'm avoiding the name. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. I just realized that these are readers listening and I don't want to hurt anybody's <laughs> feelings. I love you guys. <laughs> Whatever book you love, you are justified in loving it. Yeah, of course. You know, like, don't let anybody uh, take you out of, the things that give you comfort. Yeah. And that's like real I agree. talk. And pe- people always sometimes come to me and they're like ashamed of their book habits or their book their reading habits and I'm just like they're like, "Oh yeah, I don't read anything intellectual. I'm so ashamed. I only read um, I don't know, Jody Picoult or something, yeah. you know?" And I'm I've, like I've read Harry Potter 17 times or, the, or that sort of thing, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, and yeah. I'm just like you just have to read whatever it is that you like mm-hmm. and that's all that matters. Like if you like only reading books about sports figures or if you only like reading memoirs about celebrities or if you mm-hmm. only like reading historical fiction or whatever fine you know just read what you enjoy mm-hmm. the only thing i would say is that most people don't know that they like other stuff because yeah. they don't try true you know um and the only thing i would ask people is just to try out different genres cuz i do that all the time and i discover new genres that i enjoy that i never thought i would Mm-hmm. Like a long time ago I tried a sci-fi, sci-fi that I didn't think I was going to be into sci-fi. Mm-hmm. But I was blown away. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, there are, there are amazing books in every genre. I think the most important thing I would say to readers is hey, okay, other than the advice cuz mm. like there's a, a ton of advice you can give readers. Mm. The most important thing is do not shame people for mm. what they read or for what they write. Mm. Like 
I, I grew up uh, reading a ton after fifth grade. I didn't know any English until fifth grade. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, sixth and up, I started reading a lot. Mm-hmm. And I remember relatives would go like, oh, yeah, he's reading again. What are you reading? And I'm like, ah, I'm reading Darren Chan. It's about this vampire who's a teenager. Who g-, and they get so turned off by that. And mm-hmm. they're like, you should be reading something more useful. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's how I learned to... Um, analyze books Mm. and so when they ask me what are you reading I say I'm reading Darren Shan and they say what is that about and I say it's about how you can lose yourself Mm. when you're growing up and they're like wow that sounds very useful (laughs) give it to me and they give it to them there's a vampire on the cover (laughs) you should have been a lawyer man (laughs) (laughs) so yeah I think like it's really important to just let people read what they want to read Mm. Um, but reading widely gives you a lot more tools because every type of book has its own tropes yeah you know and um and anyways i just don't think that the idea of genres eventually is gonna i i have this um few like in my utopian version of the world Mm -hmm. like genres will not exist anymore because sometimes they Really? really yeah like i mean not that all books will be about the same thing but that like Sometimes you read a book and it's classified as a certain thing, but it's really not. Like you just, you mm-hmm. identify with it in a very different way. Yeah. So even if a book has been put under fantasy, but there's so much, you know, historical reality to it, you mm. know, d- data to it, or there's so much, uh, I don't know, of something else. It's a very literary book or it's a very funny book. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like it's, it's just, it's these genre, genrefication, it's literally just a marketing tactic. I feel like people forget that. And then they identify with that genre so much yes. that it becomes like someone, and, th- and this is me, I'm, maybe I'm stretching it a bit, but it's like when someone says, you know, I only wear LV. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like that. You're identifying with a brand. It's a yeah. category. Yeah. You know, and that's not all there is, you know? You know, I think there will actually, actually be more genres in the future, but maybe mm-hmm. I am hopeful in that as genres become more and more specific, like we're at the point where we're talking about new adult books. Mm, mm, mm. We're talking about uh, Asian-inspired urban fantasy as yeah. a genre, right? Yeah, or even like, you know, yeah. I don't know, like young adult LGBT, yeah. you know, or uh, mm-hmm. whatever. Like it's so it's becoming so fragmented and specific mm-hmm. that ultimately I think it's going to lead to a world where there's just each book is its own genre <laughs> essentially possibly you know what I mean well, it's its own world yeah. and that's really what it is I'm I think. okay with there being a lot of genres as long as people are open to experimentation yeah yeah specifically so they can buy my book buy yeah. my <laughs> experiment as in if you want to experiment in reading buy my book yeah I think everyone should start there and yeah. actually on that note where can people find your a copy of your book Okay, uh, currently, Unoriginal Tales is listed under Amazon. Mm -hmm. If you have an Amazon account that's linked to the U.S., you can legitimately read it for free. Oh, nice. With Kindle Unlimited. Kindle Unlimited is like the the Netflix of books. Okay. Right? Okay. So you pay like $5 a month, and then you can read from their entire library. Okay, amazing. And uh, basically, I get paid based on how many pages you've read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. that's if you have Kindle Unlimited. That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it makes things much more difficult for me from a pricing, pricing perspective yeah. but it, like it's so amazing to let people just read yeah, it right? like you actually can access a huge yeah. readership um, so there's that way if you just have normal Amazon you can buy the ebook for 1.2 Amani Reals mm-hmm. if you're unable to buy it by ebook uh, you can get it by print from mm-hmm. Amazon mm-hmm. if you really want the book and you want physical reach out to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, go to my Instagram at Naimi Hero. Send me a direct message. Mm-hmm. Every so often when enough people want the book, I order them at a reduced price and mm-hmm. then I just deliver them to your house. Oh, wow. And for that... See, this is the Omani service that you can't get anywhere else in the yeah. world. The author personally delivering the book to you. <laughs> there, there's one where people got legitimately upset because like, I delivered the book and this was before me realizing that people want them signed. So okay. I, just, I just gave them the book and yeah. they opened the first page and they're like, where's my signature? I'm like, um, <laughs> and I just, I put in the dedication really quickly. That could have been handled a lot nicer by the person just saying, <laughs> I to hope they're my, not listening. To my favorite reader, what's your name, Liam? <laughs> it's like, no, no, it wasn't that bad. Like it was an actual friend yeah, of mine. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, 
If you get it directly from me, the book costs like seven Amani Riyals. And what's next? Do you have any other plans? Yes, I already, I've already i already written two other books. Mm -hmm. uh, one has already been edited and now I'm just doing all the paperwork, the official stuff. So I'm basically doing three different things right now. Okay. But look forward to an urban fantasy with an old man with a cane <laughs> who's just like, and a bad and a bad <laughs> and he's like fighting jinn it's going to be sodom is going to be a good novel that's inshallah awesome. that's awesome i can't wait to do an official announcement for it okay so the title is sodom the title is going to be sodom yeah and that's because it's the public authority for anti jinn operations oh nice uh, and okay uh, sodom means strict right yeah like uh, strict and observant or i don't know what yes, the word is yes uh, strict yeah. and that's because if you there used to be like this cartoon that I, that I used to watch when I was a kid, and it's like, no, no, no. Uh, the Fist of the North Star, when it was adapted to become a cartoon in, on Space Tune, they had this. It's called what? Fist of the North Star. Okay. Uh, when it was adapted to become a cartoon in Space Tune, they had this amazing song with, that was like a mix of rock and Arabic poetry. Oh, wow. And it was like. <laughs> uh, شَدِيدٌ عَلَى مَنْ يُعِيثُ الْفَسَادِ رَقِيقٌ عَلَى الْ... And I'm like, yes! <laughs> and so Sodom is the idea is that they're strict with demons. Yeah. That they're soft-hearted with... With uh, the good people. With the good people. Yeah. So your your next book, Sodom, it, one of the muses was the Space Tune theme song for... Yeah. Fist of the North Star. I think if I want to describe Sodom, it's like Men in Black, mm -hmm. but Jinn. Mm -hmm. And also, it goes really silly and really dark. So there's... It's kind of like... Men Really silly and really dark. Yeah. <laughs> so That's yeah, like, awesome. I like how it just like mixes a, a lot of different things. Mm. There's a girl who paints her nails red, mm -hmm. and that nail polish is made out of her blood mm. that was mixed with iron, and it, it turns into swords. Like her nail polish turns into swords. So yeah. Anyway, what, what more do you want? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I love that. I can't wait. So when when do you expect that to be out? Roughly, like in what month? I would say maybe. June, July of 2021. Okay. It depends a little bit on the printers. Mm. Uh, and obviously, it also depends on uh, where we can go, where we're al allowed to go. Yeah. Because I yeah. don't want to put it in bookstores where no, nobody's really allowed to go there. You know? Hopefully, by then, that will have sorted itself out. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. And you said people can contact you for more information on your previous and future books. But... Where can we find you on Twitter, on Instagram? On Instagram, you can find me with at Naimi Hero, which is which, very conceited, I know, but I, I just named myself Naimi Hero when I was a kid and <laughs> it has stuck. So at N A I M I H E R O. Yeah. On Twitter, I am at Ammar underscore Al Naimi. Yeah. Um, and I would love to connect with you guys. Yeah. Honestly, just give me your book recommendations, <laughs> you know? Uh, readers are the best thing in the world. They're a treasure, and I will yeah. take care of you. <laughs> awesome. So I will put all of those descriptions in my captions, in the show notes, and everywhere so they can find you. And obviously on the transcript of this episode. So I just want to say thank you so much for sharing the story. It was very generous of you to share a story from your book. And I can't wait to hear what people are going to say. And I also can't wait to see what you have in store in the future. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here.